Welcome back to Modern Japan, uh, the rise of Modern Japan, the rise of the rise of Modern Japan. Really, we're back. Uh, so nice to uh, nice to be speaking to all of you again, and uh, I think we'll do our best moving forward. Got loads of interesting content today. Uh, it's week eight uh, in our module, um, so we've got I think eight, about four four lectures to go. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. Um, so let's get at it, and uh, I'll be posting and kind of some uh, pathways forward for seminar content and interactivity, uh, probably on Zoom, in fact. So there'll be something semi-live, hopefully. Um, otherwise, uh, at the very least, uh, try to get you guys connected with one another um, on paper research and things of that nature. So um, let's just get straight into it. Um, week 8, uh, U.S. Occupation of Japan. The U.S. occupation of Japan really helps to anchor so much of Japan's approach to war memory after the fact. So reaching all the way to the end of our module and perhaps into some of your 5% essays, thinking about why is it that Japan uh, has forgotten uh, about its conflicts in China, colonization of Korea, why the focus on the Pacific War and uh, the U.S. bombing of Japan as kind of the primary focal point of uh, Japanese war memory. Uh, the role of the emperor as being sort of an innocent victim of the Second World War, uh, manipulated by the militarists, and the whole Tokyo Trials uh, verdict, the Tokyo Trials vision of history, in fact, uh, is one that uh, is very much anchored in the, in the post-war period. That post-war period lasts from 1945 to 1952. So again, we're talking about seven years where Japan's sovereignty is in the hands of a U.S. military government. It is a military dictatorship. It is nominally run from Washington, D.C., but in fact, it is run very much from Tokyo by Douglas MacArthur, the American general with sort of Victorian rhetorical sensibilities, a uh, U.S. Army general who had been uh, quite famous for breaking uh, strikes in Washington, D.C. in the 1920s, uh, and his many, many years of being the main U.S. general in the Philippines, which was uh, the prize of uh, America's colonial passion, really, in the uh, 1890s uh, and into the 1930s. So uh, MacArthur was an Asianist uh, who fought the Japanese uh, very, very fiercely, of course, lost the Philippines in 1942 to the Japanese, uh, famously uh, pledged, I shall return, did return uh, with the U.S. Army, and uh, fought his way back, uh, and ultimately uh, flew into Japan uh, in uh, September 19, uh, August, late August and September uh, 1945, uh, with great glory, and became uh, also a prized presidential figure uh, in the Republican Party in the United States, and one who supposedly every Japanese revered looked up to, so it was a substitute to the emperor. Uh, so his his imprint is massive uh, from 1945 to 52, and he was in charge of the uh, of the occupation. There is a very very little blip at the end where he is replaced um, from Washington as on account of some mistakes he made in the Korean War, namely bringing China into the conflict. That's a whole other piece of global Cold War history, which we may or may not cover. But the point is that uh, the United States was uh, everything in Japan uh, in terms of its ability to maneuver events and to uh, shape the realities. So the theme of today's lecture is really sort of Japan and American exceptionalism, Japan and the American imagination. So I want to start, really, there are two, two lectures uh, that, that we just focus on the U.S. occupation, and the first really gets us into... Um, the standard narrative, the normal historiography uh, of, uh, of the United States, kind of the first draft of history, uh, where how the Americans look at the U.S. occupation of Japan, why this is important. Uh, and then uh, we do try to flip the coin a bit and look in the second part at uh, resistance, uh, Japanese narratives, the role of uh, imperial subjects who have come back home as, as sort of social rejects, really, don't, uh, society doesn't want to look at them, um, and uh, also uh, things like crimes that the Americans committed. Uh, it's really working against the myth uh, of, uh, of this pure, beautifully run, peaceful occupation. So let's start in Iraq, um, which is always a great place to start. Uh, it's, it was a fascinating, fascinating thing to observe in the United States around the year 2003, at the time when the United States and the United Kingdom were hand-in-hand hand, uh, preparing to go to war 
with uh, Saddam Hussein and invade uh, the state of Iraq uh, based on the fact or the assumption, the uh, sort of blown up intelligence, which was came from a, a German source uh, uh, in many cases, um, that, uh, that the Iraqis had, uh, had, a, had a, uh, a nuclear weapons and a chemical weapons program uh, and that Saddam Hussein needed to be disarmed. Of course, the United States and the United Kingdom did so with the blessing of the United Nations, went in and removed Saddam Hussein. They hunted him down. And there is a moment you know, in history where that occupation has not gone completely pear-shaped, where it is in the eye of the beholder in Washington, D.C., and indeed across the North American body politic, uh, certainly in the United States, um, a moment of great transformation and potential where Iraq is going to be the first really sort of post 9-11 uh, jewel in a, a new world order whereby uh, Arab states in particular uh, and possibly Asian totalitarian states like North Korea are going to be overthrown through preemptive action and replaced with democracies. So it really before there was the uh, Arab Spring, Tahrir Square and all the uprisings in the Arab world of 2011 that have led to reverberations such as the Syrian civil war and uh, the overthrow of various uh, regimes and topplings of various governments and instability in places like Egypt, um, there was Iraq. And Iraq was going to be just the first of many dominoes in the American uh, imagination of the George W. Bush administration, uh, whereby the United States was going to replace tyrannies, uh, in their view, uh, with democracies that were aligned with the West, whose natural resources were aligned with Western interests. And of course, uh, this is the vision, not so much of George W. Bush, who is a, a, certainly a willing enough messenger, uh, but to Dick Cheney, the, the very powerful vice president of the United States, his secretary of defense, Donald Rumsfeld, and a host of other individuals like Douglas Fife, uh, uh, and uh, a very important uh, person named Paul Wolfowitz, who was an expert in Indonesia, uh, kind of worked his way up through the State Department and ended up taking over um, large, uh, large amounts of responsibility for post-war planning in Iraq. These were the so-called neoconservatives in the United States. Uh, and of course, their vision uh, extended into Syria. Uh, they thought Iraq was going to fall quickly, Syria was going to be next. North Korea was threatened in 2003, and indeed in 2003 and 2004, their leader disappeared for a very long period of time. And so what does all this have to do with post-war uh, Japan? Why would the U.S. occupation of Japan have anything to do whatsoever with this effort? And the U.S. occupation of Japan does not in and of itself uh, extend the United States into Iraq. There are many, many drivers into that particular quagmire, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, many of those, uh, not least of which being kind of the composition, as I've already mentioned, of people around George W. Bush, so-called neoconservatives. Um, but that quest to transform uh, and, and to change an entire region and to create an American client state in a very hostile region uh, is one that the United States had uh, done successfully in Japan, in the view of the Americans in government at that time, in 2003 and 2004. And so there are so many anecdotes, there are many, many instances uh, during which uh, American officials going to Iraq and preparing to go to Iraq as the invasion is unfolding and after the invasion has unfolded and as things are still kind of seem to be Kind of coming apart, the Americans are still tied to this idea that uh, Iraq can become sort of a new Japan. We can really, really create a, a client state, one that is aligned with us. We can reorient uh, values that seem to be bent out of shape, that are that are not aligned in our interests at this moment. Um, we can take a semi, uh, what we see as almost a fanatical core or a fanatical population and purge certain elements of that population, of that leadership, uh, and of that army, and turn it into uh, basically a proxy for the United States uh, in a hostile region. So what were the, the elements that, that, that allowed that to happen uh, were, were multiple. They were security. 
the United States got an anchor and a foothold in Japan after defeating Japan in World War II. Massive military bases. They are still up and down the Japanese archipelago. Okinawa, as I've mentioned many, many times in lecture previously, uh, being one such, uh, one such element. You know, 25,000 or so U.S. troops based in Okinawa. You can sort of fan out across the South China Sea. From there, you can protect Taiwan. You can, you can uh, push back against China if need be, and even extend up to the Korean Peninsula. The, the, southern, uh, the southern islands of Japan, Fukuoka, uh, being a very important place for American naval bases and air bases, if you need to bomb North Korea, as the Americans did in 1950, 51, 52, and 53, endlessly uh, flattening North Korean cities, you do that from fields in Japan. So air bases, uh, military bases, massive land bases, naval bases, air bases. Um, and uh, that is what the United States got out of its occupation uh, of, of Japan after World War II. About a quarter of a million tr American troops poured into Japan. And uh, they're still there. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned in Lecture 1, uh, they're down now to about 40,000 U.S. troops. But those numbers, much like numbers that we see today uh, in various uh, public health issues, you have to question every single number you see. And how real is it? And what are the numbers that we're not seeing? So you're saying 40,000 U.S. troops in Japan. Well, how many American contractors are in Japan? How many uh, American State Department officials who are connected to the Defense Department or defense attaches are there? How many um, sort of uh, people doing uh, support work for base? How about, how about uh, family members? So, you know, in terms, of, uh, in terms of the center of gravity around American military activity in Japan, it's quite large. Uh, and it's still, it's still a very important anchor for the United States in terms of containing North Korea and in terms of uh, containing China. Uh, again, for both naval reasons and even Russia, you can intimidate the Russians and there's a lot of interaction along that northern frontier, uh, what we used to know as Karafuto today, Sakhalin, uh, and the northern territories that Abe Shinzo is so keen to recover. So the United States has a, has a foothold uh, in a region that's very, very, um, very, very difficult otherwise. And again, they wanted to do this uh, in Iraq. They, they foresaw this. And of course, the United States still has, has some, uh, some large uh, military footprints uh, in Iraq. Indeed, I have a student who's stuck there, a former student who's stuck there at the moment, as uh, studying with me uh, the sino Japanese War. He's now a war reporter uh, in Iraq. So uh, one last, uh, one last uh, anecdote for you uh, before moving into what, what the occupation uh, actually did uh, about this Iraq uh, parallel. Uh, and it kind of, it really shows in a sense the hubris uh, of the United States, thinking that, uh, you know, in the U.S. occupation of Iraq, there were no deaths of American troops on account of hostile actions, none, over seven years. So massive war, race war, war of civilizations. Uh, you know, this is a very, very bloody, very, very tense conflict as we've seen uh, when we looked at the Pacific War. And of course you have the internment of the Japanese Americans, you have the grabbing of sort of, you know, war trophies and things like that from the battlefield. But what you've got uh, is hubris uh, on the part of the Americans because the Japanese allowed the occupation to occur uh, without resistance. Uh, so there's a rapid switch to cooperation. No Americans killed. As in, as on account of, of physical violent resistance by any Japanese elements. You know, no terrorism, uh, no guns, no resistance on the beaches. So this, this vision that the Americans had of an absolute apocalypse if the United States tried to land a hostile force, you know, as a hostile force on the shores of Japan, that, which they were supposedly trying to uh, prevent by getting the Soviets involved in the war, Stalin invading Manchuria and North Korea, and taking some of the northern territories, uh, and the United States, of course, dropping the atomic bombs and firebombing, napalming uh, massive uh, amounts of Japanese urban terrain. Um, this didn't happen. Uh, things were, were very, very smooth. Um, and the Americans, of course, thought this was going to be the case in Iraq. So one last anecdote, and John Dower has written about this, by the way. John Dower uh, has uh, the American historian. It shows up all over the place. So there's a guy by the name of Noah Feldman, who is a, a law professor, I believe, at Princeton University in the United States. And uh, if anybody happened to be a masochist and was watching the uh, impeachment hearings of Donald Trump, um, you, would see, you saw some legal experts paraded before the U.S. Congress to talk about uh, the sort of international law, laws of impeachment, American law, congressional law. And here's this uh, professor from an Ivy League university, Noah Feldman, who stands, who's there, you know, uh, 
kind of giving his Ivy League testimony to, to the U.S. Congress. And I looked at this guy watching this. I thought, Noah Feldman, I know who he is. Um, he was a, an advisor to the uh, U.S. occupation in Iraq in 2003. And he wrote a very interesting book following on from his experience of flying over to Iraq for about six months to a year and advising the new Iraqi judiciary as things were falling apart. And he wrote, a, trying to create a whole new constitution for Iraq, just root and branch, because the Americans just ripped all the wires out of Iraqi society. They purged the Ba'ath Party, the party in power, so anyone associated with the ruling regime and the party that was the, the core of the one-party state was just out of a pension, out of a job, uh, sent home with no paycheck. Of course, a lot of them kept their weapons, kept their uniforms, uh, kept their allegiances. Um, but uh, the Americans ripped that out. They ripped out the judiciary. We've got to put in all new judges. They ripped out the stock market. We've got to put in a whole new stock market, a whole new economic system. Uh, they couldn't rip out of the clerics, uh, but there, uh, there were attempts to do that, and they changed the whole, the whole economic structure of the country. But the judiciary is one where Noah Feldman was sent in. And this guy, he's on a cargo aircraft, a Harvard professor, sorry, Ivy League professor being sent over to Iraq, and he's looking around, and he's kind of talking to people, you know, what are we doing? How have you prepared for this? this do we have the government in a box? What is the plan? And if you read about the U.S. occupation of Iraq, one of the things you find is that the State Department of the U.S., uh, had a rivalry with the Defense Department, interagency rivalry. This is a real thing, right? We have it in, in this country as well, um, but in, uh, in the United States, it's a real thing between the United States uh, Department of State, the equivalent of the Foreign Office, and the Department of Defense. And uh, these advisors were coming in, and nobody really had a plan, but they were all reading on the airplane. And Noah Feldman looked around and said, what are they reading? A number of people were reading this book, which was new at the time, published in 1999, four years later, 2003, 2004, people are flying over to Iraq, holding this big 700-page uh, book, sorry, 676-page book by John Dower, embracing defeat, Pulitzer Prize winning treatment, a holistic treatment of the U.S. occupation in Japan. Why? Because that's basically what we're in for. We need to totally transform this country. Gender relations need to be on the table. We're going to change, we're going to liberate Iraqi women who have been living in servitude. Uh, in fact, Iraq was quite liberal uh, and uh, liberated uh, for women uh, in its, in its uh, regional context, certainly. Um, but that's not the point. The point is that we are going to kind of give them a constitution in Iraq the way the Americans gave the Japanese a successful constitution that is still in place. We're going to, uh, there are so many parallels. Uh, and John Dower uh, really objected to his work being used in that way and wrote a couple of very, very spicy uh, editorials um, to explain uh, why, in fact, that parallel was wrong. Uh, when I come back, uh, we'll get into uh, some of the, some of the uh, going beyond the optics and the historical resonance of this and talk a little bit about sort of the, the uh, standard, the first draft, really, narrative uh, of uh, Americans uh, and their, their way of looking at the U.S. occupation of Japan.